terrific lecture for this evening. Uh, visiting critic uh, lecture, uh, Catherine Hogan and Vinnie Petrarca. Uh, Catherine is, as you all know, or you may not know, is a graduate uh, of Syracuse Architecture. She's her VR here. Uh, Vinnie did his VR at NC State. Their office is called Tonic Design, although, as you can see, they uh, they're super cool and they do amazing stuff, but their design and construction. It's a really, really fascinating office. Um, they do exquisite work. There are, the visiting critic studio will go down over spring break uh, and uh, visit some of their projects and visit their office. Uh, so next, week after next. Um, I'm really excited to see this work. I have seen a little bit of it in person, not a lot of it, so I'm going to get to see a lot of it, a lot more of it tonight uh, by, in, the, in the images. Um, uh, it's a fascinating office. Uh, they do mostly residential, although some, some commercial projects. Um, I think we'll see a wide variety of those tonight. They've won tons and tons of awards. Um, lots of AIA awards. Um, I'm going to try to just read all some of these here just so you get some sense. Um, Residential Architect 2013 Rising Star Award, AIA National Award. They won a stack of AIA Southern Atlantic Awards. Um, many, many AIA North Carolina Awards, including uh, this past year, 2014 Tupa America Award. Uh, they have won countless AIA tri Triangle uh, Awards uh, in North Carolina. And that's the RTP, the Research Triangle part. A lot of really exquisite and modernist architecture in that area. Um, they were the uh, uh, Work Architecture News, uh, they did the House of the Year in 2006. Um, they have won the Sir Walter Raleigh Awards. Uh, yes. We love that. It, how, you, how, could you, how could you not? You're in Raleigh. Uh, uh, 2010, uh, 29, 2008. Uh, also, this last year they won the George uh, Matsumoto Prize, uh, but they also won it the year before, so that's not so special. I guess they just win that every year. Um, anyway, very, very exciting office. Uh, as I said, they're teaching a visiting critic studio this semester. Uh, Vinny also teaches, I believe, at NC State. Um, a, real, uh, a really excellent school, a lot of terrific work in that area. I'm not going to say any more uh, than to say that we're thrilled they're teaching with us this semester. They're not only, they're not only really terrific architects, they're really nice people too. <laughs> there really aren't a lot of nice people. They're really, really nice people. Um, it's almost unfair that they're incredibly talented and very nice. And they are graduates of our school, and we're thrilled that they're here this semester, and even happier that they're here tonight. Join me in welcoming Tana. Hello. What an honor to be back here, uh, teaching and oops, teaching and lecturing among uh, friends and mentors, and. Uh, we're really excited to show you our work this evening. We're having a great time teaching. We have an excellent studio, and there's just an amazing energy at the school. So it's nice to be back and see that. Um, our lecture is divided into three parts. So we're going to start out kind of with a quick slideshow of things that are important to us, that explain our values, things we experience on a daily basis, and uh, kind of an essence of our practice, what, um, what arises every day. And then um, we're going to talk about our practice methodology and how that's evolved over the years and why we do what we do in our approach to architecture. And then we'll look at uh, about five or six projects specifically so you can see how that methodology kind of works throughout our actual work. And we're going to go really fast because there's a lot of slides. <clears throat> and I know everybody wants to go home. <laughs> oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> for us, having two companies, and we're going to go through these fairly quickly, uh, we believe that making and understand how you make things helps you design things. Uh, and so <clears throat> that's why our practice is really based in the field and working with tools and materials. Uh, most of our projects are ground up, so in our context, that's where most of our sites are, that's where uh, most of our clients own property and kind of a 
suburban area or um, just outside of the city. We do have some urban projects, but um, this is also the red clay of North Carolina and kind of working through all the systems of the site. And a lot of times, you know, we're hacking it out of the earth in some weird place, driving really far, but, you know, believing in what we learned in school. It does snow in North Carolina. <laughs> uh, just proof of that, it's actually snowing now. Um, and uh, this is how we work in the studio. Then we'll have, um, we'll do drawings, a uh, full set of drawings, but we also really value our subcontractors and their insights. So instead of doing uh, more drawings than needed, we just have someone do a mock-up, and we all agree on the mock-up, and then they implement it on site. Yeah, that, <clears throat> that's huge for me because Catherine's the architect, I'm the contractor. We have two separate companies, but the idea there is that if we can get, or if, I, if we can get the roofer to make the wall uh, and be responsible for all water leaks, that's a, a real win-win because if we give him a lot of money, he'll do a lot of design work for us, and then they teach us how to make drawings. Um, you know, thinking about the site and uh, the situation and understanding our place. This in particular is a diagram about implementing solar panels on a house and how form uh, allows that technology to happen. A lot of times our office is in the field, so you can see here that on the, some sheetrock scaffolding we could do anything that we needed to do in an office but on site at that moment. Educating our clients about sustainability and different systems and seeing how far we can push that within the context of a particular project. It's not easy actually implementing that stuff and so by being the you know, architecture firm in the lead construction, uh, we're able to kind of push and uh, get people paid but actually get what we want from a, a system standpoint. But still, you know, the goal is to do the best architecture we're capable of. Uh, we're a family business. That's Vinny's dad uh, <laughs> chasing everyone around the job site looking for invoices, not really realizing that the siding's actually two different colors. Yeah, but my <laughs> father would never know that we're using two colors in wood. <laughs> he just wants to know where the bills are. <laughs> it's really important for us also to use tools that come from our computers and to uh, capitalize on different ways of making. Uh, that our projects are, you know, we're pushing the architecture, but they're also someone's home, and uh, just the interior environments of light and space, and they're all particular to um, individual clients. This is Vinny's favorite slide. This, this, is, this, is, this is my, like, private safe place. <laughs> <laughs> I love an Excel sheet, and uh, basically what our, what our clients have come to us. We don't have, like... We have clients that can afford a construction load. We don't have rich clients, so the idea that they come up, come to us with a number, uh, they have a certain time frame, and we have to deliver the best architecture we can. Another uh, office meeting. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we do some commercial projects as well, so just thinking about um, our city and our place and reworking an old building to make it um, more sustainable. Uh, again, uh, this project was so public, <clears throat> it was important to me that we work nights and weekends to avoid OSHA. Uh, working with our clients and subcontractors, one big table, um, so our clients actually meet um, people on the construction side who are implementing the project and it's a, a big dialogue, big table. Yeah, when everybody gets to an office, you, you kind of hope to be in an office where no matter what meeting you are, you have a voice and to have the courage to say something because in our office, you never know where the good ideas are going to come from. It could be the painter, it could be my dad, it could be the intern, it could be anybody. So you really have to be conscious of that. Uh, we love having uh, summer interns and I think it's a really great experience because uh, the office becomes the job site and vice versa, pin up uh, making models and then seeing construction happening. Uh, <clears throat> for us, in, in the first house we built, when you build something for yourself, you really start to understand the rules and so that was our neighbor and this is how banks and appraisers kind of value and determine the program and so what we want to do is not reinvent architecture but just reuse and reinterpret the existing rules. That's what 
it's really important for us to be connected to school. Uh, and, you know, we learn so much from teaching, like we did this afternoon. Uh, and we get to share stories back and forth. So our practice wants to be always connected to academia. And then also just being exposed to the job site because that person there, we can make a model of that all day long, but they knew how to figure it out and make it easy. And we want to take how to make it easy and translate that back into our drawings. Um, just our process through our office and mentoring and having the same person sketching and drawing and coming up with an idea and then being there and actually building it and implementing it. Um, and then the final product of that, that whole process. Uh, working with clients in situ and making decisions throughout the process. Uh, we really value this. We really kind of don't have a, it's got to be this way. <clears throat> we really just try to capitalize on what's the, present, try to present the best choice and, try, and that any choice we go is going to produce some architecture that we're going to be proud of. Again, in school, Pat Rand, you guys probably read his books, be connected with colleagues that really value architecture. Uh, our city is growing um, and we want to be a part of that growth so this is a urban um, proposal for housing downtown. It's really important for me and for all of us the only way I really started to learn architecture was actually to see architecture so every spring break and summer break uh, if you can leverage it go actually visit and touch buildings and see how they're made. This is uh, <clears throat> our job site superintendent, Sean. And uh, no matter how big and how weird the task is, he seems to uh, pleasantly take it piece by piece and make it happen. Uh, we like building for other architects in our area. It's like taking a class from them. Um, and uh, this is Kenneth Hobgood Architects. He's a, a local architect. This was an all uh, uh, concrete house, concrete and glass house. We're actually, whenever we work for architects, it's actually the most profitable. <laughs> that too. <laughs> <laughs> so we try to do it a lot. This is a community uh, college bus shelter stop. Uh, and then the other thing is, is, when you get to work and implement someone else's vision, you learn all different things that you get to actually capitalize in your next design. Um, so we uh, built an office and a house for ourselves. Um, and uh, we obviously, uh, there's a lot of overlaps, but um, we took an old building and... Uh, no one it's hockey practice. <laughs> 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 and uh, go to the next one. Sorry. <laughs> we took an old building and we, uh, we fixed it up and uh, we had 13, uh, three students in our office in 13 weeks. Uh, they took the building, demoed it, and uh, rebuilt the new space. And uh, we went from renting an office to owning. We actually sold it a year ago, and we're working on our next project. Um, we torture our children <laughs> to, to understanding that the, the pattern, one of the key patterns is the really indoor-outdoor relationship for us. Um, and, uh, you know, we talked a little bit about budget before, but... Uh, these are some of the diagrams that we use to uh, talk to our clients or new clients about our practice. Um, we, uh, you know, as Vinny said, not a client, all of our clients have a large budget and actually um, only 2% of the population normally has access to an architect. So what we figured out how to do is with our construction company, what's the money that someone would need to pay for an architecture fees, we can actually roll that into the construction loan. So architecture becomes more accessible and then um, people who have like a $400,000 to $800,000 budget can actually afford an architect and do something more interesting and more tailored to their lifestyle than just having to buy something that's available in the, in the community already. And it, with that process, because we have to do um, a certain amount of drawings and we can move faster through certain parts of the process, it actually saves our clients time, which equates to money on a construction loan. <clears throat> so that's a little bit of lots of stuff. <laughs> trying to dive into what working backwards means. Uh, I think uh, that's me and my sister. Uh, I, every night and weekend, my uh, parents could drop me off at my grandparents' house. 
uh, they did. <coughs> and my grandfather was always building, and so getting dirty, uh, making, using tools has always been my context. And uh, I grew up in New York City and uh, surrounded by building and design and uh, a lot of really interesting things. So I think that our past kind of guides us into a certain place in our careers. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I never took any psychology classes, but I, I really think like who we are as children is who we actually wind up becoming as adults. <clears throat> and, uh, it was, I'm the same person for sure. <laughs> and just quickly about our backgrounds, um, I, after graduation, if, uh, went to work for Will Bruder Architects in Phoenix, and um, this is one of the projects that I helped work on the construction documents for. So I really appreciated uh, working in Will's office and starting to understand the significance of materials and how he worked with materials and how he reinterpreted materials. And uh, he was. I figure he's going to be a surprise jury in April. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> and then after that, I moved to. North Carolina and uh, worked for Design Corps, which is a nonprofit architecture office. Uh, I wanted to understand that other 98% and how they could be people could be served by architects. This uh, so I spent about a year and a half designing housing for migrant farm workers and building um, a structure, a green roof market structure. So I started to work through this construction um, methodology as well. I, I fell into a, a job with uh, Frank Carmen Architect, and I uh, worked there for 10 years. And in my second year of working there, we did this house in the Bahamas. <clears throat> and I was supposed to go down and do CA, because you know, I, no one else in the office wanted to go that far for some reason. But, uh, <clears throat> but we, we were supposed to sort of help the contractor make these trusses. In the end, the contractor was stuck in the States, couldn't get there for the two weeks while I was there with the owner. And all the laborers came over and said, like, well, you're there. Right? Well, tell us what to do. And so uh, luckily, the, the weekend before, me and my dad made one of these, so I knew exactly what to do. Uh, and so we made and built these kind of plywood trusses to withstand 160-mile-an-hour you know, hurricanes. So Frank, in a traditional office, allowed us to kind of fall into this design build stuff. With those design build, I, I would also encourage everybody to go to as many conferences as you can. I went to a conference and they put out this, AIA put out the design build book, and it just sort of opened up everything because in Frank's office we would put these drawings out the bid and we would find out we are over budget. And then I opened up the book and it says if you use square foot prices to budget your projects, you're probably going to be 35% off. And so I was like, well how are we going to get to the 10%? And the 10% means you have to talk to the trades and know what they're doing. And we really weren't connected. <coughs> And then so I started seeing work across the country, you know, Anderson Anderson, Brian McKay Lyons was doing Rural Studio, 804, and there were all these architects in the lead uh, using a design build method. And then you see like other architects like Herzog and Demeron and Morphosis and Gary, were, who are actually capitalizing on technology and being the architect lead by going to places like Zener to actually the architect directly connect with the, with the, with the installer. <clears throat> Other things that architects do is they try to manage quality, scope, and budget. And uh, this is a bridging me method developed by here in Atlanta. But the whole thing is the architect usually has to do all this work before, before you find out what it costs. And what we really try to do is like inform our clients to make the best decisions based on their money and how, how much is available. So uh, we are, our state laws say that we have to be two companies, so we are tonic design, tonic construction, a little redundant, but it comes from the, the uh, our place, our place. <laughs> yes, so um, that's sort of how that whole, whole firm name evolved. And that is also tied into to historical debates about design build and the architect's role. Yeah, and so for me, like, uh, you know, learning about Brunelleschi and getting to, to build the dome because he was the one that suggested in construction we can't wait to get all the scaffolding up. Um, and that's why, you know, and he was the master, one of our last master builders. And then pretty soon after that you have Alberti that says basically the architects are only really responsible for architect design. But then <clears throat> you have people like 
Edgar Taffel in Frank Lloyd Wright's office going to Fallen Motor and managing and interpreting the drawings with the Beaumont site, uh, the Bauhaus, you know, all, all these places do that sort of method. So in some ways, design bid is actually on the, in university studies, you, you, it's design bid is going down and design build is going up. And we're in this interesting time where the A&E, I mean, <coughs> contractors are taking over, but architects can actually start to kind of work in this area and take back more responsibility and no reward. So this is a diagram of a traditional relationship between owner, designer, architect, and builder. And uh, consultants and subcontractors are separated contractually. The um, architect and builder are separate. So there's a, you know, people want to work together, but they're not necessarily, there's often a lot of stigmas about the fights that occur and, uh, but also there's, there's still the teamwork. This model does work, but we're proposing and we work in one where there's more overlaps. So um, owner, designer, and builder. And legally, we have separate um, contracts for design and construction, but we are the same person and we are the same firm. So we you know, like everyone to kind of work together and be around a big table. So the, that Brunelleschi and design build really meant that we needed to get out to the site and learn how to make things. And then we need to get the guys who make things to get into the office and understand how to design things so that we're all on the same page. This is one of our first projects that we've, uh, a client came to us, the Childs, they were from Ohio, retiring to North Carolina because they didn't like the snow. Uh, and then we, they, they found and we showed them this steel structure that uh, a young architect had built and outfitted themselves over time but had been left to disrepair. And, uh, and John saw the house and said, are you kidding me? I'm not buying this. Uh, and then a year later they came back and said, you know what, we just came back from LA and we saw all this great architecture. Uh, can we look at that property again? <laughs> and so we were able to, th again, this was our first project, so we did everything you could, like uh, put walls outside the building, out outside the steel frame, inside the steel frame, in the middle, of um, center line of steel frame, we built things on top of it, we built bridges, and we just kept going and going and going. And, going. Uh, and one of the key elements was that, you know, the site, our students are going to see, is the site, the street's up here and it comes down the hill. Uh, and so we really wanted to kind of put something on top where they, the child would actually have lunch in all, almost all, all year long mm -hmm. outside. That, this, this canopy piece, we, we we made some drawings, we put it out with three bids, and the bids came back and it was three times what we had a lot of said put in the budget. We said, oh my god, what are we going to do? The owners were like, forget it, you got to build a house. And this is not heated space, we couldn't get the bank to raise the price, so we said, okay, let's think about it again. And so what we did was, we'll never do that again. <laughs> but in the process of that, what we did was we bought the raw material, we took our triangles, we marked it with the chalk, we hired, a, we, we hired a welder by the day, and we clamped everything ourselves in place, and they just went around it, and we actually got it for the budget. So the idea is that those firms that were actually bidding the project, they didn't know what, oh, you know, this two-way cantilevered steel thing on a stiletto hill, they had to price it to build it twice, they had to have a manager to manage it, so that guys are going to make mistakes, and so that's where really it's kind of like everybody steps on a good idea. Um, but really, when you really go down to the raw cost, it wasn't too much. And now it's a place that they use every day, and it's because of the way the house sits on the land, it needed that an, another element to kind of give it a certain street presence. And of course, your first project, you want you know, art collectors. <laughs> So we really got lucky, but you know, the, I think that people in our office that have started other offices and things that you know, you want to do as best you can with the first project you ever do, <clears throat> because then people will come to you after before that, uh, versus sort of just doing everything you can get it going. So we were really lucky to have the child's find us. So. 
So uh, this is one of our projects, probably one of the more affordable projects. Um, we met these clients. They had this incredible energy. We couldn't say no. We bartered for a few things, but uh, basically we really wanted to make it work. So these are sort of the constraints of the project, I would say, these budget numbers. And then we sent them uh, some images. They sent us some images, and they gave us the description for the house. So not only are they really wonderful people and artists, they uh, were going to allow us to do something very creative. Um, and, and, and this, oh, it's, this is really heartfelt. They only had $528,000. <clears> so what that really means to them is that they, they put you know 20% down and that they couldn't go over a monthly payment of 2400 bucks. If you could come up with a scheme for architecture for 2400 bucks a month, they would do it. And so, again, that's where we went backwards. And uh, John, our client, another John, uh, he said that this house is, we're catching up to the past. So um, this did have to do, it was a site that was already cleared. Um, someone was going to build a spec house on the, on the property and didn't. Um, so they purchased the five acre piece of land and uh, they were really interested in the sort of art form of the rusted metal and these images, but also of their context and the barns in the North Carolina landscape. So we, we, in order to make it cost effective, we looked at traditional patterns of the house and how we could take that form and reinterpret it. And the images of the acorn before are about this soft internal um, form and then this harder protective shell. And so that evolved over time through um, imagery and iterations of the project. Yeah, in spec, in spec houses, you'll see like a lot of gas fireplaces hanging off the side of the building. And we said, like, how are they doing that with that cantilever? And we figured, like, that two and a half foot cantilever was as far out as we could push with the ordinary materials. And then we just sort of struck lines to kind of rationalize the shape. So it's a house, and then she's a, a painter. So it's a studio within the house. They have two children, um, you know, normal dining, kitchen, kitchen. A living room and how we could reconfigure the typical patterns of a house and uh, reinterpret that. And it's about 2,400 square feet. It's fairly, fairly compact uh, because of the budget. Actually, the least windows that we've used on a project, but it's still a wonderful light quality on the interior. Um, but again, we go from design and idea to Fernando building it on site from a framing model and then. Um, you know, the actual construction and putting the skin. And here again, the roofer did the metal skin, so we kind of had him enrolled in the whole process. And uh, it's just, just ordinary things you'd see. It's just we asked these guys, could you do this? And they said, sure. <laughs> but, you know, if you would talk to their boss's boss and said, hey, you could do that, they're going to say, I'm going to charge you a third more. And I think like if you have a really good foundation plan and, uh, and a 501 sheet, you can basically extrude a house and build it on site with everybody. <coughs> so it, the, the skin is the hard shell and then it becomes a perforated metal screen. Uh, throughout the house, and we did that to create depth within the constraints of a, a you know, two to three foot cantilever, and also um, to sort of screen their master bedroom is actually on the front of the house, the way it worked out with the plan and the siding, and so it was create this, these moments of privacy and the light quality and the filtration on the inside of the house is very interesting. Now we go from being really nice to being corny. <laughs> Let's see what happens here. Maybe not. I'll pause it. I did. Gotta get a letter.
from the bottom of the loft. Well, my favorite part of the house is probably my room or the studio. Yeah, we'll show you. <laughs> my really mom is an artist and she paints in the studio, but our whole family does work there. My dad loves to cook, so we hang out in the kitchen a lot. Everyone in the family has a loft to keep things organized. I have a secret room, but if I showed you that, I'd have to kill you. <laughs> My room is great for just reading and hanging out. Always gets the line. And our parents' room is great for racing in. We love living in the woods, and we love living in a piece of art. <coughs> That's the great one. <laughs> Another snow day. <laughs> a theme with architectural photography. Again, this house we built, as you can see, in 10 months. In the end, it costs $115 square foot. And what we'd like to tell everybody is we have about 60 to 80 piles of money to manage and we believe that <clears throat> good design can come from any place uh, and good design can have a, any budget and type. Like, again, a theme. <laughs> Uh, so this is a house for a rock star. He owned this piece of land, I think, for about 20 years. And uh, he showed up with a, a roll of plans that was for this uh, gothic house. And, he's, and he said, uh, and then he also showed up with a stack of magazines of modern architecture and all these images. And um, he said, I, you know, I really want you to kind of reinterpret this theme of these tall vertical spaces. Uh, he's also very, he's a performer, but he's also very introverted and kind of, uh, protective and paranoid in a way, but he wanted a house for him and his son, and um, so, you know, this is very particular to him. I think all of our projects are very different because we really try and listen to our clients, and we like the challenge of coming up with something new. Um, even though we learn from our previous projects, um, each one is different. Again, here we go from model <coughs> to mock-up to site. But then also, like Marlon said two weeks ago, you know, trying to find a, a way to rationalize, post-rationalize, how, how we come up with ideas, <clears throat> you know, it, it, it's just not a linear process, that's what we're telling everybody. It's like, you know, just got to be aware that you can come at any time, you just got to grab. So this is, um, you know, the, the project where we had the roofer do the siding, but we used a standard... Um, you know, window company window, they're all consistent in size and we tried to organize them like notes on a music staff and kind of come up with, there's three widths of the siding and really come up with a system and then use that throughout the house. And uh, this is, you know, he want, a lot of our houses have kind of a big window or our clients want as much glass as possible and he really didn't. He wanted particular views, he wanted to kind of reinterpret this this protective window, the archer's loop, and um, and so there's a lot of light in the house, but it's it's pretty private. And uh, there's the skin that wraps the building. Programmatically, it's um, his space, and he has a music studio, and then his son's space and the library. And there's a 30 foot tall living room in the center of the house. He kept asking us to make it taller and taller, um, so we had to you know unbalance, figure out how it would work within the limits of the budget for structure, but also for mechanical reasons and efficiencies, and, um, and then the stair. And so... Um, this is similar to what we learned in that house with the canopy. <coughs> we put this steel, the steel package out, and we got killed. And so again, we basically built self, when we're out on site, we'll self-perform certain things. We like to manage almost everything, uh, but this is one where it was so integral uh, to the project, and we couldn't go over six hundred thousand dollars. That we bought the steel, marked it up, clamped it up, and then uh, just hired a welder by the hour. And the whole—if we hadn't been able to make the stair work, I think the whole design would have evolved into something else. And he really wanted it to be as transparent and 
um, you know, it's, it's steel bar grating, so you can see down through the stairs. His son didn't want to <laughs> walk upstairs for a few weeks when they first moved in, but he really, he just loves the experience of the house. Yeah, we have one so more the video. This could be pretty loud. <laughs> oh, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We might want to turn it down a little bit. Okay. Yeah, this is the rock star house. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Uh. project that uh, <clears throat> a very small budget, $40,000, um, basically built on our Museum of Art campus. They asked us, they, here's our old building, there's a new Tom Pfeiffer building right here now. We have to update our picture. This is a Barbara Kruger installation, and there's basically this huge art park. And they have all these installations, but they have no place to bring kids to take a moment to talk see what they're going to see, and then come back and see how they're transformed. Uh, <clears throat> so we were given, not this site, but we were given a site down here in the valley. And we came up with this shape of a grasshopper, kind of trying to be as tall as it could because it was just so low next to a creek. Um, but there was this uh, little outlook. And we kind of worked through it, you know, again, how do we make these steel things happen, so we said there's no way we'll be able to fabricate this and bring it to the site. So what we did was we made that shape, the shape of the path, so that would be our job site table. And so we were so excited, we got approval, Tom Pfeiffer came down, uh, was working on the building, and then they said, ah, you cats can't use perforated metal, Tommy's using it. It's like, what? It's <laughs> like, well, we're already done, we're ready to go. No, not going to do that. Uh, you're going to have to change the skin. And then another week later, they said, actually, we're going to change the master plan of the site. And we're going to give you a new site, so you're just going to bring it up to the hill. And we're like, you can't do that. <clears throat> and so what we had was down in heat power, but down here, they asked us to be really public now. And I, I wanted to show this to everybody, is that, you know, <clears throat> you, we, we have to love what we're doing, but we can't fall in love with to, and hold on to what we're doing. Because we, we wanted to see this one realized. Uh, but we didn't want to dig our feet in the sand and lose the project. So we wound up redesigning something even better. So I think like, as our architects, our young architects, you know, developing that lateral thinking to be able to analyze what you're doing is important to generate new ideas every time. So in the end, we got the different site. It was very public. It had this path running around it, but there were trees. And so when we built the building models, we realized it was a big wall. And so it really became about how we break the skin in this wall down in shape. And we did all sorts of models. And we, on fact, we went to a solid aluminum panel so we could go back to perforated metal. <laughs> uh, so we worked with perforated metal and, and the ideas of opacity and transparency. 
and how we can get the, the pieces of paper to fold off the building and grab the light. This is one where we built in the summer, and so we hired three students from NC State. Um, this was our old office. And, um, Uh, <clears throat> if you can see, or anybody can see, like I was really proud of them because they built all the caisson rings while we were out on the job site. We came back, they were so happy, and I was like, uh, you guys put the bars on the outside of the ring, not the inside of the ring. <laughs> and so, I know Matt, who's working in a construction company now, never forgot that lesson. <laughs> and so we made, to you know, get the pieces of paper to fall off the building, we made these kind of like uh, skateboard ramps in the office and we fabricated everything as a, as a kit of parts. Uh, painted everything and we you know, these sort of moment connection kind of ladders or columns. And then uh, fabricated again back to those early, early lessons of we'll do all the work, clamp it together, and we'll hire somebody. Because uh, again, this was $40,000. There were some donations. That's the final product. So that the kids, we made these boxes where they put the art supplies and tables and things. Um, and what we're really proud of is in North Carolina, there's only been a few projects that hit a high level. And like Matthew Nowitzki, we've got Snowheda, Pfeiffer, and then down here we've got these three students from NC State <laughs> that kind of like rocked one summer and went right to the top. And, uh, you know, this image is really significant to us because there was someone working in our office and there uh, was like a week program and her friend asked a, another friend to the prom on the building. But, um, you know, really this is, for us, we really enjoy these types of projects. We were a part of our art museum campus. Uh, people get married in this building. They have parties here. They take photographs. They do yoga. It's just really nice to be a part of our city in this way. So... That's our goal moving forward, to do more projects that are of public nature. We're going to show you two houses that are on the boards, and we'll let you go home. <laughs> I think we're doing a good time. So this is a house for a, a mechanical engineer who's highly obsessed with the thermal envelope of the building and also their race car drivers. Um, and they insisted that we use precast uh, concrete for the, for the house. So... Um, they actually brought that material to us. And so since he was all about performance <clears throat> with the race car and the mechanical engineering, he was like, how can I get this house as efficient as possible, use the least amount of energy? And so one of his first things was to say, like, you know, if this was our house and we had all these windows, what do you do? And typically in our architecture, you actually put more insulation in the building. So you make this more, uh, put more insulation in your wall to deal with all your openings. And so what he was saying is like, well, and you know, all the passive aspects were saying, you really need to look at the windows. And so we got these windows from Austria, Austria. Mm -hmm. that perform almost as good as some of the walls. <coughs> and so what we're trying to do is actually isolate the entire envelope of the building, including the double slab. And we actually, after this, we split the footing so that we are an <laughs> and this was, we were trying to realize our client's vision, but he was, I mean, he was pushing every aspect of kind of saying, well, how can you make the insulation connect? How can we push this further? So it was, it's a really interesting process of having your client kind of... Um, yeah, and I think this is, that's probably a, a key point between like uh, critical practice and critical teaching, is that you kind of, in practice you kind of hope that someone comes to you with precast and this vision of thermal you know, our projects it could be a rock star, it could be an engineer, it's whoever really walks the door um, is what we get to work with. Whereas, in, you know, in, in the other ways you project different values. <clears throat> So uh, we went with them and we did a lot of work with the precast company, which is about an hour from our office. Somehow, Catherine always finds it. Orange <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this is, you know, in their in their place of where their offices are. We're trying to work with the project manager from the concrete company through wall section to just have the dialogue right there on site and see how they work, and then reinterpret it or see how much we can push the boundaries of.
their normal processes. Yeah, we bring beer every meeting we have to with Chris. He's really the gatekeeper, and you can see he's like, he's like, you want to do what? <laughs> it's like, no, no, we really want. It. That's ridiculous. You're only going to say point zero insulation. It's like, yeah, but we really want to do it. <laughs> but the owner really wants to do it. So this house is, um, it's under construction now. And uh, these are just some renderings. They wanted it to be a warehouse, and there's this dialogue between house and shop. So the shop is treated just as a house would be with the windows and kind of the, the finishes. And so they want to be able to see aspects of both in either place. Uh, this is a, another project um, that's still in basically schematic design, design development. They, these clients um, have built two modern houses already. Uh, they're two separate houses on adjoining properties. They want to have one house. They're also uh, founders in our contemporary art museum, so they're really passionate about design, and they've already been through the process. So, so the two houses add up to that, and so we've got to come up with something in our design collage that has a million dollars in receipts, or else they won't do it. So just similar design process of building models and working through their idea. And then, uh, you know, we exchange precedents. They're really about this framing and experience. They entertain quite a bit. Each room that they described to us was about a different experience and a different way of choreographing that experience. Yeah, they really pushed us in the sense that we're always trying to, like, think of the whole, but they were always thinking about the room, and they didn't really care about all the other rooms. And so we kind of came up with this idea of these, these, uh, these experiences on the site. And just ways of communicating that to them and really locking in the idea so then the, the budget material, it can work towards the budget and establishing the material language of the process, of the project. More models and renderings. So just like uh, we were telling our guys downstairs is that we try to come up with like a quick schematic, push it, and then, you know, do the best we can. But what we really want to do is we want to jump to that. Because this drawing here represents every one of those moments, those white frames. And so I can draw on one piece of paper, you know, the, <coughs> the entry, the cantilever box, the kid's bedroom, Piece here. And so through wall section and understanding how are we going to make these frames as thin, thin as possible and read so that the architecture comes off as much as best we can. It really comes from this, this kind of exercise. And then we don't get too far into the development. We often meet with our clients on the job site. <laughs> but uh, we don't get too far into executing too many drawings before we have to go back and do something over. So we kind of like to go to the end, work backwards from there. And Marlon and then, said it. He said, you're basically are trying to establish a tectonic language that you can actually create a diagram now, as opposed to creating a diagram and hoping it's going to work as well. Or also understanding that um, how to make that diagram so that you have your they intent, there are specific intentions about your project and it's not left up to just typical ways of building something. Here's so here we are. <laughs> it seemed really nice on the, on the first day. It was so nice to us. We had so much fun. Then they got really kind of intimidated. <laughs> I signed up for what? <laughs> it's been a real pleasure kind of like uh, the whole school has really welcomed us uh, and made things so easy. And then to have our studio do the work and kind of go with us in these ideas about trying to figure out, you know, from construction image how something is made. Uh, we're really, we're very, so, so happy to take the time and figure out a way to make this possible. And the work that all of you have done uh, to this point <clears throat> has been so good. That, uh,
Thank you. What do you, you mean as the budgets as a consideration or how we work together? Okay. Well, I'll, I'll give you, I'll try and answer and you let me know if I, but we're, we're a really small company. We have uh, Sean, who you saw in some of the images, runs the job sites. And uh, so everyone's kind of having internal dialogues and uh, interesting discussions trying to get it all to work. Um, but budget is, we show it so often because you know, we're trying, our clients come to us and they have a certain amount of money and they want something built. We don't want to develop an architectural project for them and not see it realized because I think especially with much more constrained budgets, this is something that they take very personally and they're really passionate about. So I think that's really, you know, one of our strong um, things that we consider. I'd also say that uh, I'll take your question in the way of traditional practice where the contract and architect are separate and then design build where we're all together. There's all these sort of problems with the first method and we still have the same problem. <laughs> <laughs> it's just that we have to figure out a way to make it work and we're forced to. Um, <clears throat> so our, our, one of our clients coined the phrase is, is go with design build. There's one throat to choke. Because <laughs> they won't mess with Catherine. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, it, it's really interactive, and, uh, but it, it really comes out of uh, how much people are going to pay per month for architecture. And also the best architecture possible for that budget and what we're capable of. I think, you know, design, even though we're two companies, we're both, we both went to architecture school, we're really passionate about architecture and design, and that's, that's our priority. I think also with teaching and some other interests that we're moving forward, we, you know, certain technologies and certain materials we might be able to use on project for ourselves. Like we're, you know, working on our next <coughs> office. And so that might be a venue for letting that guide the, the project. 
Yeah. Here it comes. I knew it. Is that happening? Yeah. I was, um, thanks for watching. I guess mine is more about form and where that's coming from. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me, if we look at the work, you have, you inherit a steel frame on one project. There's uh, looking at, we'll say, vernacular construction as a, as a kind of source on another project. Um, the, the mechanical engineer was a performance-based project. Mm -hmm. There's the Victorian house as, a, as another kind of model. So I guess I'm, I'm wondering, I mean, I think the work is remarkably under control, but I'm wondering what they, what you collectively work through relative to form generation. Mm -hmm. to, to me, it's, it's how you assemble a building. <clears throat> so the method of assembly determines the form. And so I think both questions are kind of the same for us in the sense that we, we want to find out where we're going to put our money what that material or product's going to be, and then use that as a filtering device for as we work through a wall section, and then and how we make that wall section uh, determine its form. And I think a lot to do with the site. You know, we we talk about that's a very much the beginning of our process where you know all of our there's many similarities, but also the context and working through some of the sustainability or technologies that a client might want to have implemented. Also, form based on efficiencies and working and the budgets as well. So, and also the programmatic kind of constraints of what our client presents to us. So, I think it does, there is some grounding in the way we've done projects before, how we build, what we know, and then how we can reinterpret that with a new set of variables. Yeah, another thing that determines uh, inform is <coughs> how a building sits on the site uh, and what the shape of that building is because you know the most efficient shape is a sphere. We can't build that with a chop saw. Uh, and so we're looking at versions of 90 degree kind of squares or working within the most the least amount of perimeter for the max amount of square footage. Because the max amount of square footage determines our budget <laughs> heated space. And so when we make a building really long and thin or an L shape, we pay a premium for the wall. Whereas so that that also comes into play mm -hmm. is the geometry of the shape. So a lot of stack. Um, you're talking a lot about uh, obviously the design build and how construction influences it. Um, I'm wondering how much it influences your design. Um, the fact that a lot of times you know, we build rhino models and, and you can take it, no, you can't actually build that in real life. Um, does it allow you opportunities to, instead of building something and the contractor saying, oh, that's not possible, you're doing it on purpose? Does that influence how you design things? Yeah, I think, I mean, definitely knowing how something's going to be made will influence the design process. Um, you know, we've sort of worked through uh, building a certain way and an understanding of materials that also, you know, using to new technologies is very exciting to us and we're, you know, we're always open to that. It's sort of getting a better understanding of those tools and then, and, but it really is about how something's made and then not necessarily saying you can do this or you cannot do this, but how do we collectively make this happen, I think is usually really important. Yeah. I think uh, the way Sean's kind of worked through uh, explaining to me the exhibit in the, the main atrium and how you're taking a vinyl model uh, with a certain material and coming out with certain things, but really engaging the makers. So like, as long as you can connect to who's going to make it, I think they're going to help you make your design. I feel that good design <coughs> is about taking advantage of opportunities. And so when you listen to somebody that's in a, in a factory or, or part of that project, uh, if you can sort of reshape and what their knowledge is, then you get win-win. You get a good design and it gets built. Does so, that help you? Yeah. Uh, first of all, thanks again for uh, the echo of the things that you already heard for the lecture. The work is, is beautiful. It's very, very nice to see the range of it. And um, so for both you guys, Catherine 
uh, and Minnie and Catherine, this may ring more true for you because you have the history with this place. But it's, it's a, a question that kind of comes from uh, discussions of the relationship between <coughs> design and fabrications over a longer historical view, I suppose, for some you know, material work, there's a kind of moral component to it, or maybe something more along the lines of what is truer. Um, and at the risk of projecting something onto your work, it, it doesn't seem so much the case here, and more of a way, perhaps, of the fact that you build work to fabricate your work. Is it fair to say that this is just a means towards a better realization or a, a more uh, compelling realization of the design ambitions that you have, and maybe at the same time a kind of critique of, uh, or a critical response to, not so much critique, but a critical response to business models that have put um, construction here, design here, and because construction co uh, controls the money, it, it kind of has the opposite effect on uh, your ability to realize what your, you know, whatever your design ambitions are. Is that, is that yeah. fair? Yeah. yeah, I think so. I mean, um, you know, for us, if we didn't build, in many cases, a project wouldn't happen. And that's just because, for I think for two reasons. One is that many contractors just are not, you know, they're going to charge you more because it's details they haven't executed before or they think it's complicated. Um, and also because our budgets are, a lot of our projects have been pretty tight budgets. And so how can you, sometimes if you have a little more control over the execution, then you can make it happen and you can get more for your, for your dollar. I think the other thing is that we see there's a lot of benefit to being on the job site and to making a change, an unforeseen opportunity that you don't, necessarily you can't see in the drawings you can't see until it's a three-dimensional space and to have to do X amount of you know drawings or um, pieces of paperwork just to kind of make that happen and deal with change orders it just seems like a kind of a, a more um, a, you know a venue for unforeseen opportunities to happen and we, we really like to kind of engage those so I don't know if that Answer some of your questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, I have a question about the uh, the kind of the process that you went through to get here. Um, and I think that part of the challenge that you faced was that you didn't have a lot of experience in that area. Um, and so I was wondering if you could talk about that and how you approached that and what you did to make sure that that was the right thing to do. And then, you know, when you were in the office, you were able to make sure that that was the but those architects, we wind up doing that, and they, the next project they do something different. But we get to keep that lesson. And so every time we make something, uh, we, our tool bag gets bigger and bigger and bigger, <coughs> so that we can really, uh, you know, I would say like, you know, that's kind of the, the best thing about being, and we, we didn't want to, we went to architecture school, <laughs> but we're builders. We need to, in our, in our place, we need to, we need to become a hybrid to make a living. Um, but in the end, we want architecture out there. And so that, that's kind of like, you know, our real thing is how can we stay within a modern context, mm -hmm. push as far as we can push, um, make a living. Um, but by, by the real benefit of being a contractor is there's so many lessons that now we get to use as design. And even if we don't, some of our projects we don't build either. It doesn't make sense with timing or it's, you know, we've learned a client it's probably better if we don't kind of <laughs> follow through to the, that stage of the project. But really we think as builders walk through the design process. So I think that still gives them, you know, certain benefits and we're encouraging them to talk to contractors at a certain stage in the process as well. You seem to have found a very nice balance for the scale and the scope of the projects that we do. I'm just curious, have you had any thoughts, discussion about growing the practice, taking on the larger projects? I mean, how do you see the, your practice in the future five years from now? 
Yeah, you know, I guess it was probably three or four years ago. We were about eight to ten people. And uh, that was a time when um, people in our area, was, the economy wasn't that good, but people were building because they thought they could get really good deals. So we took on all this work, and we didn't think that the designs got it better because we had more work. They actually, you know, I think we, we didn't have the time or capacity to really focus in the way that we wanted to. I think we will grow. Right now, um, we're smaller just because we'd like to really do a few things well and we really enjoy being part of academia and I think that that, um, you know, to have the practice evolve in that way is, is one goal. But, um, you know, I think uh, at a larger scale, doing larger buildings and commercial work is is interesting to us. We'd also really value just being the architect on on projects like that as well. So, I don't, I don't think we'll scale up, <clears throat> but we have aspirations. I think we've watched Brian McKay Lyons over the last 15, 20 years and how he can do an amazing house and how all those patterns of house that transferred into a university building. Uh, and so I think like. In time, we'll team up, but I think our goal right now we're really just two part-time employees because <laughs> we got these little girls that are killing us. <laughs> so it's like studio again. We work on nights and weekends. <laughs> uh, but uh, <clears throat> I think that's to do more public stuff is more important. Uh, it connects yeah. to more people, like that picture of prom. Yeah. Um, designing that nice house for a client is great, a great experience, but it's not the same as doing something that we can, anybody can visit. constituents together to build a school or you know, a new university building, that's, that's a lot harder, I think, than 